Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, joined today by Shabri Raja, who's the co-founder of a company called Nepris, which is now known as Pathful. We're going to be talking about the future of work and the importance of exposing young people, students to career pathways as early as possible and many other things. Before we do any of that, I'd like to welcome Shabri to the show. Welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you having me here. Yeah, you have a really interesting background as I was prepping for the show. We always like to start by you sharing that with our listeners so they get to know you a little bit better. Can you catch us up on your origin story as a learning professional? Uh, absolutely, but how much time do you have? This would take a while. <laughs> yeah, my uh, background has always been in education technology. We go a few more years past. I uh, grew up on a coconut farm in South India, very rural to parents without college degrees. So a lot of my work really stems from my own childhood experiences or the lack of it. And for nearly 14, 15 years, I worked at Texas Instruments and their education technology group. That's how I first got introduced to schools and tech in classrooms. So pretty much my entire career, I've been working on building the right technology tools for the classroom. Mm -hmm. But 10 years back, I got very involved with working with nonprofits and uh, intermediaries uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area who are really working on how do we bridge the STEM pipeline gap, which eventually is the workforce pipeline gap, right? Mm -hmm. And I got involved with a lot of discussions in the community where various st stakeholders like industry leaders, education leaders, K-12, higher ed, community colleges, intermediaries like the chamber, the economic development, everybody was getting together and having these day-long conversations about what is the role of industry in education? How do we prepare students for the future of work? Yeah. I mean, you know what happens at these events is everybody has good intentions. Everyone's taken the time to be there. We have amazing discussions, a whiteboard full of wonderful ideas. But at the end of the day, it's a great networking event and there's a nice happy hour. And then we all go our ways and nothing, I won't say nothing happens. A lot of work was happening, but in science, mm. some companies were doing a lot. But really, when we think about how do we bring equity of access, that was really what drove me because coming from where I grew up and the lack of exposure, I somehow ended up okay, yeah. but you can, luck is not a strategy. So really looking at, you know, you fast forward two decades and my kids are growing up in a very different environment in Austin, Texas to two parents who are in technology. And yet we see the same problem. They don't right. know what they don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't be what you can't see, right? Mm -hmm. So. And then we are still, there is a huge rural population. And even in urban areas, students coming from underserved communities don't see role models within their own community. I could relate to a lot of these things, to my own journey and pathways, right? I was fortunate enough to connect with people and role models and mentors, you know, various points in my life and ended up where I ended up. But many kids don't have that opportunity. And that's really what we set out to solve. We saw on one side all these stakeholders wanting to do something about it. And we saw this big gap on this other side that this chasm between industry and education. And it was very clear to me that technology wasn't playing a role in connecting all these, these stakeholders. Right. Without technology, how are we going to scale? How are we going to really bring equity of access? So that's really what got me and my co-founders started on this journey with Nepris nine years back. We said, you know, there is a simple solution to this big problem of connecting industry and education. As kids are learning in the classroom, they need to be able to understand how you can apply yeah. this to the real world. I mean, at the end of the day, why are we educating all these kids, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's the purpose? Not to take tests, but really to, at some point, be gainfully employed and to be happy yeah. and to contribute to the economy. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the end goal. But somehow we all get distracted on they need to get good test scores and this yeah. and that. It's all a path to that. But really, the bigger issue is that they really don't know why they're learning what they're learning. You know? right, right. And I always joke about this. I have two engineering degrees and I still don't know why I learned calculus. I mean, until I actually listened to a Samsung session on Nepris where they talked about how 
before they they decide to purchase an eight hundred million dollar machine, how they actually forecast the supply demand curve, yeah, and justify that purchase and the calculus is used in it, and it was like, oh my god, moment, you know, yeah, it's like it was a bit too late for me, but I'm a big calculus guy too, so yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to have to, to to get into a math discussion right at the top, but I am a big believer in the, for me points of inflection. Min yeah, max, yeah, min yeah. maxes, you know, but yeah, yeah it's hard yeah. when it's all abstracted. Abstract, yeah. Yeah. But a lot of the problem of relevance, you know, why are we studying this is addressed yeah. through a lot of the work you've been doing, which is very much about exposing younger learners to potential career pathways or ways to connect what they're learning today to yeah. what their career might be in the future. Can right. you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, this is basically, we started with this very, I won't say narrow, but it's a very focused approach to solving this problem, right? Because we wanted to change the idea that, oh, they need to be exposed to careers means we need to conduct career days. You mm -hmm. know, doing one career day a year is not going to cut it. This is why we said, no, career exposure doesn't have to only happen on career days. Career exposure needs to be part of your core curriculum classroom. It has to be every day. So if you're learning about rocks in second grade, you should be connecting with a geologist. You're learning about ratios and proportions in sixth grade. Why not have an architect connect with your classroom and explain how they're using ratios and proportions while they're designing these plans? So that's really, you know, it started with real world relevance. Because that's the stickier way to learn. It not only is exposing them to careers, but imagine the level of student engagement in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? We are always saying, how do you keep students engaged so that they can more meaningfully understand what they're learning? And then they automatically, they understand the lesson, then they're doing better in their tests and all, all the traditional methods, right? Yeah, yeah. And then we also, in the last couple of years, there's been so much focus on career and technical education yeah. as you go up the grade levels, which is such a positive for the students and the school system, because as early as middle school, you're thinking about career pathways and how you can actually get certifications and, and courses and stuff. And the other big thing that CTE education is driving is the fact that not every kid is actually going to go to a four-year college because it's not feasible for a lot of the kids to go to four-year colleges. Yeah. And there's a huge shortage of skilled labor in our industry, like all these big manufacturing companies. And there's so much opportunity, yet we are traditionally preparing students for college and not for career. You know? Right, when right. College and career readiness, it primarily becomes college readiness and not career readiness. The introduction of emphasis on CTE, career and technical education, has really shifted the K-12 education a little bit to more awareness around a pathway for every student, even if they're not going to a four-year college. Most school districts, almost all of them have CTE pathways. So students can actually choose a pathway even as early as middle school and get deeper into a pathway, get certifications and enroll in, in these different tracks if they want. They can even as early as high school, they can somewhat specialize and understand better on, on things that they're interested in. Yeah. But the bigger question is, by the time they get there and to make those decisions, are we exposing them enough to all the opportunities that are available so that they're making the right decisions when it's time to pick and choose certain pathways, even by the time they go into college? Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, as I mentioned, yeah. I am the, the parent of a soon-to-be four-year-old. Yeah. And, you know, through Legos and other mass media that's out there, yeah. there is some exposure. A lot of what PBS Kids does is good in yeah. terms of representation. And we try it to do is. the same thing in terms of books so that you see, you know, a kid of any color, gender, identity yes. could become an yeah. astronaut or could become president or yeah. could become an yeah. inventor. How early do you think this stuff can and should be baked into our K-12 system? As early as possible. When we first started, we were also guilty of assuming elementary is too young. Mm -hmm. And we tried to do this with middle and high school students and connecting diverse professionals into classrooms to bring that relevance and exposure. But soon enough, we figured like most of the elementary teachers in the beginning years were coming to us saying, why can't we do this in our classroom? And especially with the more and more classrooms doing project-based learning, 
I mean, we were one of the early ones where we were actually connecting working professionals into elementary classrooms. It was more driven by the elementary educators, which we didn't really think there was an opportunity there. But they really sort of pushed back and said, no, we do want the same opportunities. And that really opened our eyes to, oh, my God, why didn't we think of this? But at least we listened to our customers and went back and did it, right? So really, it's even as early as kinder. Like we yeah, have kinder yeah. classrooms that are learning about weather that are actually talking to a meteorologist. Yeah, you know, yeah. it just becomes part of how they learn. That's how we can bring about sea change. It's not like saying, hey. By the time you're in middle school it, or in high school, it's already a little bit too late. You, yeah. you, you formed your, you have your perceptions, you have your ideas. And the sooner, the better. In the last two or three years, I'm seeing more movement and school districts trying to actually get career readiness into the elementary classroom as well. With Pathful now, we have a, a junior product that actually is directly connected to the junior classroom. It makes a lot of sense when I think about the types of enrichment programs that you see, yes. like it's frequently like tiny scientists or yeah. arts. And many of those things involve either making something or doing something that, is- that could ultimately get you on a path to a career. And I think frequently we just forget to maybe make that connection. I- I've been really happy that my son in pre-K, you know, one of his favorite classes is science and the fact yeah, that yeah. the pre-K has a science program is somewhat hopeful for me. And then to me, that all connects back to the future of work. And yeah, yeah. when we're trying to train folks in a universe where the cycle times are all accelerating, Correct. skills and careers are being disrupted faster than they ever have been before. How do you think about that aspect of this? You know, we haven't talked about artificial intelligence yet, but it is really the one thing that in a world of emerging technology, that's the one space where it could be genuinely disruptive to the types of work that humans do in the future. Good how, good do you, good. how do you think about that? And how do you think about how we get kids aware of the change that's coming without frightening them, frankly, just because yeah, it no, it's useful absolutely. to have an anchor to plan for. It's not just AI. Like in general, the world of work is changing. Through COVID, we've seen even what we define as a workplace has changed. I mean, yeah. this change, it's decades and decades of thinking about workplace as one thing that it just changed in a jiffy overnight mm-hmm. because of COVID, right? And this new workplace of whether it's remote, hybrid, whatever combination, I mean, it requires a different set of skill sets. That's one thing, right? And then what the jobs of the future looks like, nobody knows at this point, right? That's where I know soft skills is a term that a lot of people don't like to use, but it's it's the growth mindset. You know, how do you impart to kids like having that growth mindset so you know when things are getting outdated, you have the ability to upskill and reskill and keep going, right? Mm-hmm. I was at the piano last week at ACTE. Is someone from the Nevada Department of Education who said, we don't like to call it soft skills. We like to call it durable skills. Yep. You know, I love this and I'm going to use it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's that's really the core of how do we get students to understand and really prepare them for these durable skills, right? So that's where like a lot of the project-based learning, these things come into the picture I often talk about the three pillars of career, the Entangle Solutions report that came out uh, three years back um, really does a great job of talking about these three pillars of career. And we made that sort of a foundational framework for what we are building at Pathful as well is occupational identity, skills, and social capital, Mm -hmm. right? It doesn't matter. It could be your future job, could be in AI, Maybe more machines are doing the jobs that humans are doing. And we've been talking about this for decades too. Yeah. No matter how the job environment changes and how that side changes, the bottom line is this framework of the occupational identity skills and social capital learning. The occupational identity is giving students the ability to really see a wide range of people in various careers and opportunities, knowing that there's a whole world of career pathways out there. It's not just the 10 things that they've been exposed to. It's like I said before, you can't be what you can't see. 
So how can we really first help students see the whole world without leaving their location? Because not everybody can get on a plane and travel and see the world. Right. So that's number one. And the two is when we talk about skills, that's the durable skills. It's very difficult to be in a classroom as an educator and impart those skills to your students. How do you do it? You can stand up in front of the classroom and teach them skills. Yeah. Like you have to give them an opportunity to really sort of practice those skills. And that's where the project-based learning, where mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to connect with an authentic audience. Students are working on a problem. They're solving a problem. And now we are actually thinking about how do we get industry directly involved in providing these problem sets to students. Mm -hmm. Students are actually working on real-world problems and projects. And in that process, they have an opportunity to really work as a team, understand how to really communicate and get in front of a real authentic audience who are in the industry, leaders and professionals, and be able to present their solution and take feedback and listen. I mean, these are the durable skills, right? It doesn't right. matter whether it's AI or data or whatever comes in the future. The importing those durable skills, it's a tough thing to do. Unless, and this is where we say there's a whole world of people out there. There's a network out there. There's companies who have projects, leverage all of that and really give your students the chance to engage with the audience and put them in the hot seat and let them practice those skills firsthand. Yeah. And eventually everything ties to social capital, right? Who you know matters. Eight out of 10 jobs are got because of who you know. Right, uh, right. That's part of your durable skills as well. How do you? meet new people and learn to engage with them and build those relationships and continue to nurture and connect and create value for your network. You don't want to be the person who's always asking, asking, asking. So these are things very hard to teach in a classroom, but you have to put the students in these positions of projects and working with an outside audience and being able to present to them, get feedback. And in this process, they're actually learning the skills to build social capital. So that's the framework we really sort of look at and abide by. And it, it speaks so well to how to prepare students for the future of work. It doesn't matter what jobs come in the future. Jobs right. are going to come and go. It's always been like that every few decades. There's a sea change in technology. Your existing jobs go away. New jobs come into the picture. But you need to be able to get the skills and the social capital and the breadth of uh, exposure to say, okay, I can easily morph and change and have that growth mindset be the glue mm -hmm. that brings this all together. It makes a lot of sense. To me, it brings me to the idea of paradigm shifts. You were talking about the sea change or sea changes that have happened in the professional world. Absolutely. But then when you look at education, the model is still moving pretty slowly. You know, you <laughs> even described your your own Children growing up in the U.S. are not necessarily getting as much more than you might expect compared to what you got growing up yeah. in South India on a coconut yeah. farm. How do we accelerate the change within K-12 and where do you see the transformation happening there? Because it does feel like for us to succeed as a society, we're going to have to get out ahead as right. early as possible and really integrate it throughout K-12. No, that's easily said that, and I wish I knew the answer, right? It's not just one thing, as you know very well. It's a combination. And in the last five years, I feel like some of this positive change is starting to happen. Yeah. Like even so much emphasis on the career and technical education. And a lot of times it boils down to, Mike, it's the decision makers, the policy changes, has to align to funding. And then that has to align to teacher accountability. Yes. You know, all of these have to align, right? If we are just talking about this in one portion and we're holding the teacher accountable to do these things in the classroom, their accountability is based on test scores. There's right. already a huge gap, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm starting to see a lot of changes happen. But like the whole movement to move towards career and technical education in the last couple of years, it's not like you're you know, grandfather's vocational education anymore. It's becoming more and more mainstream. And that's because, you know, at the national level, Perkins funding has aligned to this. Yes. Now school districts have the ability to say, if I want to implement programs like this, I have the funding to do it. It's not something that I have to figure out on our own. It's really the decision makers, policy makers, curriculum, 
school district decision makers, educators, everything needs to align and parents too. It's all of these things need to align and it's not an overnight change, but I see positive changes happening and it's trending towards that where it's not just the career focus, it's how students learn in the classroom being more project-based and things are starting to shift a bit, but it's like you said, it's happening much slower, but it's starting to happen. And that's where the problem is sometimes in education, you're in your bubble, like you're working within the four walls and mm -hmm. you're like every day, okay, I have to get through this lesson and this unit. And then I have to check these boxes and they have to take a test. And But creating the right incentives within a school district to say, hey, now we need to do work-based learning. We need to create opportunities for students to do internships or create opportunities for students to do projects that are connecting with industry. My feedback is there is a whole world of people out there, industry leaders, employees, even parents. Most of your parents are professionals. They're all there. You need to figure out a way to elaborate the outside world to bring them into the classroom. I mean, that's the only way we can sort of expedite this change. And that's where technology can help, right? It's easily said than done. You can tell a teacher, yeah, go leverage all these people, bring them into your classroom. But that's where I feel like education working in a silo can only get so far. Mm -hmm. The good news is that there are so many people wanting to contribute and help. And how do you sort of leverage this and make it part of your everyday teaching and learning so that you, you can shift, you can really shift the way that students are learning today in the classroom. The role of technology is really fascinating on this front where, especially in light of the pandemic, it feels like new conduits and convergence zones have emerged where right. through hybrid right. classes and the way people are thinking about workshops, even, you know, challenges for teachers. I was talking recently about how there's a lot more like digital work that is becoming right. part, like responding to emails right. and managing these yeah. apps. But as someone who yeah. spent a lot of time in ed tech, I'd also love to get a little more of your perspective on where you see the most positive innovation opportunities, where you see the real breakthrough potential around educational technology, whether it's Pathful or other types of applications that you see out there. I'd be curious where you think our listeners might want to focus their attention. Oh, wow. So you already said there is a lot of AI in education companies that are yeah. emerging. I think the future is really there. I recently met a couple of founders who are working on how do you really transform math education using AI. It's really, you know, we've often talked about a sort of differentiated instruction because not every kid is where they need to be in a classroom and a lot of kids are left behind. And so this is where all of this technology can help. We're seeing a lot of AI in work-based learning, like how do you uh, AR, VR in yeah. work-based learning, that is happening. I still, I'm, I'm still somewhat skeptical about AR, VR and still, I think the cost of hardware has to come down a little bit. Yep. Maybe it's four to five years away where it becomes more commodity. Yeah. And that's when I think you can really impact change because at this point, there is a heavy investment in hardware for schools to adapt and schools are not, you know, you have to find funding to do that. Yeah. Again, it's the same problem anytime there's new technologies, you know, whether it's AI-based instruction, AI-based bots that are helping students when they're not in school. There are a lot of companies that are getting there to really like, I mean, at one point we had two drink platforms that did extremely well. The next is going to be sort of bot based platforms, right? That can really connect every student can get the help that they need. Still feel like education, it, as long as there is not a heavy capital investment for school districts, I still see that as a barrier in adopting some of these new technologies. Yeah. But hopefully we've seen the trend historically these hardware costs will eventually come down yeah. and it's more accessible to everybody. Those are some of the trends we see. And then from a pathful perspective, no matter how much technologies change, really sort of connecting people outside of your own environment and sort of including this whole community. The one of the trends that we're seeing across the board, across the country is these sort of local retail 
ecosystems are organically forming. We're seeing this in Kansas City. We're seeing this in Oregon. We're seeing this in D.C. I just had a call with Omaha, the STEM hubs. It's a combination of like nonprofits, K-12, the higher ed industry, the employers, everybody getting, this is how Nipris got started many years back, but we're seeing these regional ecosystems forming more rapidly now in this space, which is great. Everybody's getting together and saying, how do we work together? So really for school districts to figure out what their local ecosystems look like and how they can be part of that. And this is where with Pathful, we're trying to say, how can technology help sort of empower these ecosystems to really leverage these relationships and make it something that they can scale? That's something that is really uh, giving that ROI and empowering everybody within this ecosystem to contribute towards helping that student to prepare for the future of work. Yeah. Because sometimes we talk too much about emerging technologies, but we have to remember the the human connection, the relationships, the ecosystems, the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. We need to be nurturing those as well. Yeah, that's where the social capital is, is through those connections. And then also that is where you start to understand, or at least as a student, you start to understand, and maybe as educators representing those students, here are some emerging pathways, partnership opportunities, those sorts of things, which is really amazing stuff. Shabri Raja is the founder of Nepris, which is now Pathful, and you're looking ahead in interesting ways, and we're trying to keep up with you. As we're getting closer to conclusion here, you're someone who's really been able to chart your own path in terms of your own career. Is there any advice you might have for folks maybe earlier in their career in education, whether they're a teacher or an entrepreneur or someone who's just curious about making an impact? You're someone who's already been able to do that, and I'm excited to see where you take things next. But any advice for our listeners out there in terms of charting a path in the world of education? Yeah, I just based on my own experiences, I would say it's really the relationships matter. Really looking at your network and saying who I know, how do I really leverage this network, but not just as somebody who's always taking from your network, but every relationship I build, I always first think about how do I give back to that relationship as mm-hmm. well. There's always a mutually beneficial connection. So, so that's one thing is really leveraging the relationships and making it a two-way a win-win situation. And two is I feel like being authentic is such an important part of this journey. I mean, we're all in education. We wouldn't be here if we didn't care about student impact and making sure that we're really authentic. And I've always been comfortable talking about my failures as much as the successes. I never knew how else to do things. I think being your authentic self is so important as an entrepreneur. And the third one, which is still work in progress for me, is always listen and and take feedback. I I always take good feedback, but but sometimes as entrepreneurs, we all have so much going on and we have so much to offer. Listening becomes a lower priority. (laughs) So these are the three things I would say is invest in your social capital and give back first. Be your authentic self and learn to listen better. Amazing advice, not just in education, but certainly for our listeners and for all of us. Shabri, Raja, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate you all giving me the opportunity. Awesome. Uh, Hopefully our listeners got as much out of this conversation as I did. If you like what you heard, please write us a review. Tell your friends. Do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. (laughs) 